your life. Welcome everyone to today's Oasis Lunch Time Four. Oh, so in case you didn't catch that, welcome everyone to today's Oasis Lunchtime Talk. It's hosted by Tampere University Game Lab. Today's speaker is Dr. Ian Storick, a senior lecturer in games, animation, and visual effects at the University of Tees site, with two S's, and visiting scholar at the Center of Excellence in Game Culture Studies. Dr. Starrick's scholarship examines game motivation and questions of identity and world building across digital games, tabletop role playing and war games, and live action role playing. He is a game designer with expertise in game design pedagogy. Highlights of his game design repertoire, which is like at least six pages long on um, Board Game Geek or RPG Geek, so it's long. Uh, Slain, the role-playing game of Celtic Heroes, and Conan, the role-playing game. He runs an independent RPG publishing house called Serpent King Games, Serpent King Games, which is the publisher of the classic fantasy role-playing game Dragon Warriors. Dr. Stark's talk today is called Creativity in Academic Research, Narrative and World Building. Please join me in welcoming him to Oasis. Over to you, Dr. Stark. Thank you very much, Tom, and thanks for the invite to do the Visiting Scholar stint as well. It's been a really, really enjoyable couple of months so far um, and very productive and, and good for collaborating. So I'm not going to go through all the research interests. They've all been sitting there for ages. I'm going to talk a bit about play first because I kind of feel like that's more interesting in some ways than the academic side. Oh, apparently Spacebar does not go down. Ah. I might have to just click. There we go, clicking works. So mostly I do LARP, like I do this for fun. I've been doing this for more than 40 years. Um, I think serious, like hardcore Nordic LARP scholars might look askance at it because it's all boffer LARP, you know, which apparently is, uh, is a little bit de classe uh, compared to the, uh, the more serious stuff. Um, but for me, like there's a lot of potential for quite rich emotional engagement with my kind of, we'd call it live combat LARP in the UK. Um, you can still have that kind of deep intrigue and interpersonal relationships and power politics and everything else. Um, it's just that there's a threat that somebody might stab you in the night if you intrigue against the wrong person. And I quite like that little edge it brings. And again, I feel like it, it allows for a lot of crafting potentially. I mean, most of these costumes and, and bits of props and so on, I've made at least some of myself because it's cheaper and more fun and allows one to kind of access, express one's creativity a little bit. Um, and again, I think we get a lot of potential for a lot of fun roles and, and, and fun moments. I mean, uh, this is it from a Warhammer 40k LARP called Death Unto Darkness. And this is like a, a, a real tiny, brief and quite cute interlude, I think, between barrages of, of kind of um, uh, fake gunfire and, and melee combat against weird mutants and so on, as, as me and the other techno barbarians share one respirator between us so we don't die from vacuum. Um, so yeah, I, lo I love this stuff, and I think in some ways it's, it's important to talk about how we find fun. Uh, and I think, again, it, it fits with the talk in some ways that uh, I would argue that play is one of those universal human constants. I mean, we're almost in Sutton Smith territory. I promised at least one mention. Uh, he probably kind of runs through the whole talk, really. Um, but I feel like it's the origin of creativity and art and games. Uh, and so it's really important to keep with that kind of fun factor and that play. Um, I have an unusual kind of academic career in some ways. In, I did my undergrad degree in Manchester between 88 and 91. Uh, that's Manchester, UK. Like I know this is kind of Manchester, Finland, and, and we do call Manchester, UK, the, the tampera of the UK, obviously. Um, but uh, I graduated in 91 at the start of the early 90s recession that nobody's remembered now. And there were no real options for doing postgrad study at the time that would fund me. There were no jobs, really. Um, and I ended up kind of living in assorted squats in Hume in Manchester, um, getting involved in uh, Hume's Crusty Circus, Dogs of Heaven, where, you know, this was, we, we, we said farewell to this huge um, four blocks of hundreds of squatted flats um, when the council finally got a bunch of European money to demolish the lot. And we got a little bit of that European money to 
throw old cars off the roof and have uh, a champagne fountain made of old bathtubs and fireworks and all this other kind of cool stuff and did this epic show um, that you can catch some of on YouTube, I think. Um, and so that was what I did for a chunk of the 90s. I did um, delivering organic vegetables via bicycle and trailer around Manchester. I, I ran a, a pagan and occult bookshop for uh, some years, like with a lot of kind of alternative book content as well. And that's, uh, I guess, probably 30 years ago uh, with fancy poet shirt and, and posing for publicity photos for our very early website, uh, which never quite got finished um, before the, uh, the shop ended. Um, so I didn't kind of come back to academia for many, many years. And actually, um, I did my game design career before coming back to academia. I don't have a master's degree, which might make me weird for a person with a PhD. Um, I spent a lot of years um, doing this tabletop RPG design that Tom has already mentioned. Uh, again, like quite pleased with it. There was some, there was some award-winning sort of stuff there. And then another recession happened. Um, you probably, most of you remember 2008 and gradual knock-ons from America's uh, economy finally starting to implode a little bit. And one of those impacts was the pound was suddenly super strong against the dollar and I was getting paid in cents per word. Um, and so suddenly my, although I'd finally worked my way up to a decent income, uh, it was suddenly down by about 25%. Uh, and yet I was living in North Wales at this point and there was potential funding for a PhD. So I kind of gradually started easing my way back into academia about 12 years back. Um, and it was quite nice to have that game design practice background to bring into my uh, academic career, which again, I don't want to go into huge detail, but we, I, I've kept on a little bit with that. Um, I was massively encouraged really early on by Esther McCallum Stewart, Dr. Esther McCallum Stewart, um, currently of Staffordshire University, a LARP contact, like a lot of my kind of friends and professional contacts as well. And um, she's running this year's Worldcon in uh, Glasgow. But 10 years ago, she ran the academic track of the London Worldcon. And we did an E&M Banks game, or a bunch of E&M Banks games. We did like about four days of game jams and finished up with this amazing kind of live action, almost kind of LARP meets theatrical performance meets uh, board war game kind of thing with trying to recreate a game of Azad. Um, with adjudicators with giant hats like they, ha they are in the e and Banks book um, and players kind of standing in the zones that they'd conquered and making, if, if you found um, one of these bags, um, this was a bag full of Lego that we'd scrounged together and you were encouraged to sit down and, and uh, in real time kind of make some Lego war machines so you could send them to attack your enemies. And we kind of adjudicated it as we went along and it was a lot of fun and we, we had a winner eventually. Um, and we had, uh, yeah, yeah, just a, a lot of fun with all of that. Um, we had some really nice uh, top-notch game designers just hopping into the jam. Steve Jackson of um, Steve Jackson Games, you know, came along. He, he presumably was a paying punter like everyone else at Worldcon. He just came and helped, helped us make games. Uh, Dr. Eleanor Roberts had a huge impact on this as well. Um, lots and lots of um, uh, work on uh, some of the mini games that were used towards this. And again, I think it's really nice to be able to combine that academic aspect with a bit of practice-based research. Uh, so on to the main topic of the talk. Uh, it's, it's all about creativity. And again, if you're lucky enough to be studying game design here, uh, which I think is probably a few of you, right? Uh, any game designers or are you all more, more theory kind of people? Um, fantastic. Uh, are you still studying, Casey? I mean, you, you probably are, right? We, we all, we're all still learning. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, fantastic. So um, I always tell this to my game designers, right? Um, you do have ultimate freedom as game designers at university. <laughs> Nobody is going to censor you and tell you you cannot do your amazing hentai or edgy bigotry game for your final project. But it is worth considering censoring yourself a little bit because we've probably seen it all. If I've seen this kind of game often enough to be bored of it, you can bet that recruiters are as well. And if you do your lovely tentacle porn uh, game in Unity, and that's the main thing on your portfolio. Not only are you immediately in, oh, this person thinks they're a kind of um, maverick genius territory rather than somebody who will just fit in nicely and do the job. And so you've got an immediate strike against you in terms of recruitment. Um, also, they kind of think you might well be the person who's responsible for um, a human resources case within the first week if you work in there. So you probably don't get the job. So while you can do this, 
you've got the ultimate freedom, have a think about doing something that's maybe more interesting and a bit more fresh, um, rather than whatever you think is going to shock people and probably won't. Um, so we're going to talk about creativity a little bit, uh, and I, I have got three subcategories here of academic research, because I kind of wanted to emphasise that all the kind of research that we do from kind of master's level onwards and certainly at PhD level and beyond, there's a massive creative aspect to it. We're often told, uh, often in primary school, uh, in places which have bad primary school education, such as the UK still, unfortunately, we're often told, oh, you're not creative, you know, or you're not, you're not good at music, you're not good at math, something like this. And uh, you're better at doing this, you know, um, that's your career path worked out at the age of six, right? Um, and I think it's really important to recognise that creativity is, is within all of us. Um, the inspiration for this part of the talk, incidentally, is very much from uh, my colleague Jim Thompson of University of Central Lancashire, who in 2013 came along and gave a keynote talk about creativity to the first Global Game Jam I was running, um, and kindly said I was welcome to use his slides. They've mutated considerably in the past 11 years, it's maybe only two or three, um, still from his slideshow at that point, but he did kind of bring together a fair bit of research from various sources, including, I think this was probably from a kind of meta-analysis of lots and lots of different studies that asked people about what they thought was creativity. So if you, if you kind of look on your scientific literature uh, about characteristics of a creative individual, you'll get a lot of things like school teachers being asked, you know, um, what do you think makes a pupil creative or this kind of thing. And there's some common aspects that keep coming back. Uh, knowledge in this context usually actually means skills. Um, it's, it's the ability to do stuff. Um, it's, you know, if you're making a game, it's going to be, you know, probably some proficiency in uh, Unity or Unreal. Um, maybe you're more interested in the narrative side and you've learned that through Twine or Inky, but you've got those kind of skills um, that will allow you to actually do the creative thing that you want to do. Um, experience is crucial, right? Have you done it before? Um, and again, this is where a game jam or something like this is going to be so crucial because um, it gives you that permission to fail. Uh, and that's how we learn. Um, and if you haven't had that kind of low stakes chance to make the thing that you want to be good at, um, you absolutely should do it because it makes you realize um, that it's okay to mess up and learn from those mistakes. And, and again, that's where most learning happens. Um, attitude is, can you, do you think you can do this? You know, have you got the kind of attitude also to get on with the rest of your team if it's a team aspect? Uh, now, I was struck a couple of times after seeing this talk from Jim uh, how much other people who were in the creative field tended to have three things that were quite like this, not necessarily exactly the same. When I started work at University of Hertfordshire for my first kind of full-time academic job, one of the first people I met was Frank Victoria, who's concept artist on a load of amazing um, Weta Workshop movies. Uh, and it was really nice meeting Frank, partly because he's a really nice guy, but also the pressure was off. I was not going to be the coolest lecturer at University of Hertfordshire because he already had that absolutely covered. Uh, you know, it kind of comes across as like a, uh, a kind of really gentle, friendly, giving kind of guy, constantly drawing or sketching. It would be a huge university meeting and be sketching the dean, uh, you know, never writing notes. It was always written down uh, in, in kind of uh, beautiful art form. And, um, and he also kind of came across as a bit like maybe a French barge operator or a Studio Ghibli protagonist, which immediately made him charming. But also, he had some great pep talks for students. Uh, and one of them that I listened to several times that he would say again and again and again was he, he said, as a, an artist, there's three things you need to succeed. And again, I would argue this is the same for almost any creative sphere. Um, he would say, immerse yourself in art. Now, Frank is a very traditional fantasy artist in that he really, really likes heavy metal music and drawing barbarian red-headed ladies with enormous axes. Um, but in terms of art, he would be immersing himself in whatever it was that came to town. You know, if there was a hip-hop show or pop art exhibition or something like that, he would be going along and seeing what he could learn from that because getting outside of your comfort zone is how you get better at art, right? Um, and he would sort of say always to these students, like, oh, that's the easy bit. You know, you just have to be open to all these new artistic experiences and make sure you go, most of these exhibitions are free. You just go along to them. You know, it's easy. Acquiring the technical skills, he would say, is easy. You just have to do your life drawing classes four times a week and practice at home and, you know, follow the, um, the, the, your favourite artists and copy their work initially and then, and then um, use that as a model for learning your own work. And again, I would say this is the same with any creative field, really, you know, that he was a bit, a bit jokey, obviously, about this thing being easy, but you, there, is, there are step-by-step -step ways to get better at all of these kind of creative skills. And then he said, and this is the easiest one of all, this, uh, be, be kind and professional. 
And I discovered um, what he meant by this because he, he chatted to me a bit about having left Weta Studios. He'd gone to Peter Jackson, who he was a good mate of by this point. Um, you know, the, the, the studio apparently is really, really friendly and they all do kind of I think it's World War II reenactment together. You know, some of like this might be World War I. So they're, they're all kind of socialising together and working these long hours and it's like a, a family and this kind of thing. And he said, um, you know, I've been working here 10 years and I haven't had a pay rise and I feel like my skills have gotten better and I've made you a lot of money with all these movies and can I have a pay rise, please? And was told, uh, no, you know, it's been really great working with you. We want to keep working with you, but I can't afford to give you any more money. Uh, and Frank uh, apparently shakes Peter Jackson's hand and says, uh, well, thank you very much. It's been a really nice 10 years. I'm going to go off to the UK and be a concept art lecturer instead. Uh, and I think I would have struggled to do that. You know, it's very rare that I get on with former bosses. And I think I would have been grumpy by about year three if I hadn't had a pay rise. You know, certainly one in, 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 a, in accordance with inflation, at least. And so I thought, okay, this is somebody I can learn from, right? You know, if you can actually stay, maintain that kind of kindness and professionalism, because he could really easily walk back into a job at Weta or any other studio if he wanted to give up lecturing. And having that ability to just stay chill is really, really worthwhile. Um, and then I haven't met this uh, chap, sadly, um, but you're probably all familiar with him even more so than, uh, than Frank's work on movies, right? Um, Gaiman did a really nice... Um, talk, I think this was again to um, undergrads, and he talked in that one briefly about the three things that he found were useful as a freelance writer. Um, and I found this really helpful, again, having done freelance tabletop RPG writing. I was like, well, firstly, he says you only have to do two of these well. Um, <laughs> you know, if you can do two of these consistently, um, you can be a bit weak on the third one. And I thought, amazing, if I, need, if I need to do a career change again, all I have to do is start being nice. Because my work's already good. I was never going to be on time. Um, <laughs> but if, if, I can, if I can just be nice to all of my colleagues and, and my potential employers, then I can get consistent work again. Um, but yeah, I, this was my experience in tabletop RPG writing as well. You know, any two is pretty much fine. And actually, being on time, if you're not on time, but you're good at communicating that you're not going to be on time, then despite some lecturers at my university often saying things like, you know, if you're in industry, you know, if you were an hour late, you'd be sacked, you know, this kind of thing. Well, no, there's honestly, there's wiggle room everywhere. If you tell people beforehand, look, I need an extra day or an extra week or something, preferably not half an hour before the deadline, there is probably some flexibility, you know, you, unless you're literally working on a daily newspaper, um, there's some wiggle room there. But yeah, again, I felt there was some similarities between that and Frank's work and this more general work, and, and it was worth mentioning this. So, um, there is going to be some drawing from real science in here, and I'm not, I don't really think of myself as a real scientist. So, if you are actually a neurologist or a psychologist or a sociologist, then firstly, I apologize for what the mess I'm going to make of your subject. And secondly, I thank you for providing it as a, a useful fuel for our creativity. Uh, and also thank you for not calling me out when I get it wrong. Um, so we're going to bit, borrow a bit from neurology here. Um, creativity apparently doesn't like to be rushed. And I've heard from various people who, who've apparently done the reading that I've probably been too slack to do, that this is down to the way that the unconscious mind works, that the neural pathways tend to be kind of big and slow uh, in the unconscious mind as compared to the conscious mind. And so if you want to have the real deep stuff, if you want to tell the story that only you can tell that's about your childhood experiences and the formative stuff that's made you who you are, you're not going to just come up with that off the top of your head when you stare at a blank piece of paper. Uh, because lots of authorities say there is this five stage creative process and you can't skip any of it. It's all crucial, right? So we have an initial insight uh, and we get told there's a problem and, we, and we're going to try and tackle it. And that can be anything from I've got to come up with a new game system for a D&D supplement to um, I've got an essay and it's due next month to, you know, I've got an academic article and it's due next year, you know, uh, I've probably got some wiggle room there. Um, and, and we then go into stage two preparation. We try to understand the problem. We might do a bit of brainstorming here. We might make a bunch of notes. We might draw some diagrams, some flow charts, something like that. We, we jot down some possible solutions. Probably at this stage, none of the solutions feel like they're going to actually quite work. They, they feel like they're heading in the right kind of direction. Um, but none of them's quite it just yet. And then stage three is the one everyone tries to skip. We need to actually relax. We need somewhere between two days and two weeks where we're not thinking about the problem consciously to allow the unconscious mind a bit of time to work through it. 
And that gets us to stage four. Unexpectedly, a sudden emergence of the idea, that act of insight, that creative leap, that eureka moment, bolt from the blue. Um, it would have felt, I think, before we knew a little bit about how the brain works, that this was being put there by the gods. Uh, you know, this is kind of why Plato, it's one of the reasons Plato dislikes poets, is he feels like poets and bards aren't really coming with anything new. Uh, you know, Jupiter just pops that song idea into your head and then you just sing it. Uh, you know, you, you, didn't, you didn't make it up yourself, slacker. Um, and it, it, does, it feels that way, you know, without, without necessarily wanting to have any kind of religious aspect. It feels like it's come from no, but it's actually just your unconscious mind having worked on it and, and having, because you gave it that time to relax, um, it pops into your head apparently from nowhere. And then unfortunately at stage five, the actual work begins, right? Uh, we've then got potentially months, you know, if we're doing a game, this is where our iterative design process is going to really kick in. Uh, you know, we start to produce an actual game based on our amazing insight idea. Um, and then we start testing it and iterating and making it better. Um, so we have a bit of information about where people's grand ideas came from. Um, what it was that they were doing when they had this bolt from the blue kind of moment. Uh, how they were relaxing. Half asleep in bed is a really, really common one. Um, you know, four instances. So we know that when we're just starting to wake up or just starting to go to sleep, we can have these hallucinations, uh, hypnagogic hallucinations, um, if we're just going to sleep, or hypnopompic hallucinations if we're just waking up. And it feels like it's a mixture of dream and reality, right? You can, you can be looking across your bedroom and suddenly you see stuff that's not actually there, right? And that's an indication, again, that, I mean, I guess, um, Feel like we're in fairy tale mode here when the veil between the worlds is thin right it feels like the the gap between the unconscious mind and the, and the conscious mind is at its easiest to access when we're half asleep um, and again i think sutton smith mentions this briefly in ambiguity of play he talks about this constant flow of ideas and images that the unconscious mind is producing that's what we see when we dream but when we're awake we have a kind of door that shuts and stops all that stuff preventing us from doing regular everyday things like crossing the road or using a computer, you know, which would be really hard to do if you were constantly generating ideas in front of your eyes, right? Um, but I think, arguably, not only can we learn to do something about accessing those ideas and those images uh, when we're between wake and sleep, but also, arguably, part of the uh, act of becoming more creative will allow you to access them more easily at other times as well. And I have in the past recommended dream diaries, you know, potentially you can make more use of sleep. Um, we're almost in dystopian TV territory, I know here with severance, right? But uh, if you keep a dream diary, even if you're pretty sure you don't remember your dreams at all, uh, if the moment you wake up, you write down everything you remember, even if it's just like one image or a few words, uh, by about six weeks usually, you find you can remember a whole dream and it gets easier from then on. Not long after that, you can start doing a bit of lucid dreaming and maybe a little after that you can say to yourself, oh, I really want to dream up the solution to the creative problem that I've been working on overnight. Come on, brain, get to it, go to sleep. And maybe that following morning, maybe the morning after, the idea's there, worked out in your head. It's not necessarily um, quite as restful as having a regular sleep, but it does do the job, right? So. Other possibilities, out walking or riding, I assume this is kind of horse riding or cycle riding, you know, it's, I think if you're on a motorbike you don't necessarily want to be having a creative insight. Uh, most of these kind of travelling approaches, the travelling is probably trains or buses, it's got to be something that allows you to relax and take in the changing scenery around you. Uh, being out in nature has been found to be particularly good for this. Um, in church, you know, again I don't want to make any assumptions about um, the veracity or otherwise of any given religion. Um, I suspect that people having a creative insight in church are doing so because they're very bored rather than because, you know, the gods have come and put something in their head there. And I've never been invited to dinner with the queen or king or anything like that, so I don't quite know about the state dinner stuff either. But I, I'm assuming that it's also a boredom thing, that, you know, you're sitting there waiting for the cucumber course to end, and, and finally you have that insight because you, you are bored. Um, sitting in front of the fire, obviously we've got lots of fireside tales, we've got lots of... Um, uh, stories about fireside tales as well about the the the, the storyteller or the shaman of, of or somebody sort of sitting in front of the fire and, and telling us ghost stories or uh you know our, our cultural history or something like this and we imagine the fire uh creating images in our head because it's perfectly capable of doing that um so again i can see why that would that would work 
Um, so another useful diagram potentially uh, is Robert Diltz's circle of creativity. This is where we start to get into some actively useful creative practices. He based this apparently on uh, Walt Disney's dream room. Uh, I don't think Disney was probably a very nice person, but maybe he had this initial useful idea, right? Um, apparently the, the big room in, room in the dream room, which is where you get all your animators and storytellers and people together, is that you can't harsh each other's vibe. Um, if somebody's having an amazing vision for this uh, this cool story that they want to tell, you can't tell them, oh no, that's unrealistic, that would never work, we haven't got the budget, it's not technically possible. You have to just let them keep dreaming. And Dilt suggests not quite making a dream room. I don't think we've, most of us have got enough room in our house for a dream room, a realism room, and a critic room. But for being able to consciously select a particular mode of thought, either personally or for your creative team, uh, you go into kind of dream mode and you're just doing that kind of brainstorming, coming up with cool ideas kind of phase. We're not going to think about the practicality of it. We're not going to think about the fact that we've only got two days to make our global game jam game and, and five people in the team and the, you know, your, your idea for a massive multiplayer game is not going to fit into that. We're just going to dream for a bit. And only after we've finished our dream are we going to start to be a bit realistic about it. What have we got the resources to actually do? Uh, what are the constraints? that are going to prevent us from doing precisely that. Is there anything that we can scrounge though or scavenge from that dream that will still fit into the constraints that we've got? And that's when if you realise that you can maybe do something based on that, even if it's not your initial idea, uh, you can start critiquing it and um, going into a bit more depth about exactly how you're going to make it work. And then potentially you can go back into dream mode again and do this, uh, do this cyclical approach. So um, how do we fit all of that into assorted creative processes. Again, I would say that academic research fits into this and into the five-stage pro creative process really, really well, inherently. And the way, I, the reason I brought this up as, as part of the subtitles really was, I feel like that creative process is the same whatever we're doing, more or less. Uh, I think once we get onto the more narrative side and or game design side, we want to start looking at a bit more specific techniques, and so I will be talking about those for the rest of the talk, really. Um, so it's quite nice to have metaphor in our creative pursuits, um, if they are kind of narrative heavy or game heavy. Um, and these are really frequently tied into the meaning of what we're doing. And so if we want to do stuff that's not just another shooter, we've got to think about that meaning and metaphor side, so it will help us drive home the points that we want to make. Um, J. L. Borges um, has some amazing lectures on this stuff as part of his uh, Riddle of Poetry series that I think he gave at Harvard in the 60s. Uh, and he would argue that he would studied um, particularly poetry across different cultures. And he argued that there were lots and lots of different um, cultures that would have the same kind of metaphors in their poems. And so he'd argue that these were cross-cultural. And I think we can draw from that and say, actually, we can throw some of these metaphors into our games or novels or whatever it might be and have that same impact as Borges identifies uh, in the original poems, right? So stars as eyes, uh, or eyes as stars. Um, you know, if you talk about somebody's eyes as being full of stars or the night sky staring down at you, we can see that kind of association there. Um, he talks about dreams and butterflies having a close um, association and butterflies as being seen as a transcendent uh, aspect. And then life as a dream is closely connected to this. He talks about a, a, allegedly a, a, a story of a Chinese philosopher uh, who woke up from a dream in which he'd been a butterfly and wondered immediately whether he was a philosopher dreaming he'd just been a butterfly or a butterfly currently dreaming he was a philosopher. And, and Borges kind of says, you know, this only works because it's a butterfly, right? If he dreamed that he was a sloth or an armadillo or something. It just wouldn't have that same kind of beautiful, floaty, dreamy quality. Uh, and that's why butterflies fit with dreams and some other creatures don't. Uh, I'm not going to go through quite all these, but let's do battle as a web. I mean, this, I think he draws on uh, Anglo-Saxon poetry for this one, um, but I think he's also talking about Persian poetry and various other bits and pieces. Um, it seems like a bit of an obscure one initially, uh, but I feel like this is about fate and about how if you enter into, you know, kind of some medieval or ancient world battle and it's about melee combat, right? You can't be sure you're going to escape. The moment you step into that battlefield, it's as though you're drawn into a spider's web. And again, we get notions of uh, fate as being a weaver, right? And 
are you able to escape? It's, it's not down to just your own skill anymore. It's partly down to luck or your destiny. And likewise, swords or weapons as fire. If you imagine um, in pre-industrial societies where uh, you might be getting raided by another culture and they're on, on this hill with the bright spring sunlight uh, glinting off their assorted weapons held high. And not only do you realize that this represents fire as death, but also as the destruction of your people if you don't manage to fight them off, right? So again, you can see how most of this works. Doors as Choices is such an obvious video game one, but like it, it, it fits outside of video games. And he's, you know, he's talking about this in the 60s before there's um, much in the way of video games of the very early Pong. Maybe a, maybe a video game scholar can uh, let me know. Um, you've also got surrealist metaphors. I always think these are a bit weirder to use inevitably. Um, they're not going to be cross-cultural in the same way that ones Borges identifies are, but maybe you've got an idea for a really cool arty game. And I think that Breton and Dali are worth a look for um, how this kind of stuff works. Um, Dali, because he's had a lot of stuff written about him, and a lot of people are trying to interpret some of those metaphors. Breton, because handily, he actually tells you a lot about his creative process um, in his book Mad Love, which is really worth a read. Um, he talks about these various different ways he's got of really, to my mind, activating that fourth stage of the creative process, um, often by going around Parisian junk shops and antique shops and finding a particular object and having that spark off the next piece of artwork or um, poetry or, or book or whatever it might be. Uh, so, also related to um, themes and metaphors, to my mind, is thinking about the ethical side of your games, how we're going to, uh, as Sickhart puts it, um, put the player into the game system in, in a way that they can then explore their own values and the values of the game itself and create this open-ended ethical space um, that's designed for that kind of uh, ethical exploration. Uh, and he cautions against using a very binary system of morality like um, you know, the Fable games or most of the uh, Star Wars games uh, because you can only explore them in a very limited way and, and you're constrained by the game designer's moral beliefs. You know, if you've played Fable and um, taken a particular side in a minor village dispute because you thought you were the goody and suddenly been told that you've, you've actually done something bad, you know, it's because your morality didn't agree with the game designers but you're kind of pissed off with this, right? So I've got a couple of nice examples here of games that have got a bit more nuance. Um, I'm, Disco Elysium probably doesn't need much introduction to people in this room, I'm assuming. Uh, but one of the things I love about this is the authors as kind of avowed communists, right? They could have taken a really strongly political stance with the game and made it all a didactic game about how we should all be communists. And it would have tanked, you know, it would have been a critical and commercial failure because it would have been a bad game. So they don't take this approach at all. They, they criticize communism pretty much as much as any other political system in it, if not more so, because they're so obsessed with it. Um, and it allows for a really rich game where, you know, if you, are, if you have got somewhat leftist sensibilities, you can spend the whole game being sad about the failure of the revolution. Uh, if you want to explore other stuff, then there are other political endings that are equally satisfying to get as the leftist endings and, and will allow you to explore those kind of nuances. And then um, the Six Ages series set in Glorantha, uh, tabletop setting, these are amazing for kind of taking you back into this kind of Bronze Age tribal setting where there are not necessarily anything resembling binary notions of good and evil where all of the decisions that you make will be about finding a balance between uh, pragmatism, looking out for your people, looking out for tradition, embracing new things, uh, diplomacy between your group and other groups. Uh, there's so much depth there potentially and I think these are both worth a look if you ever want to make a game with that kind of depth that Sickart talks about. Um, so further on that ethical and moral side, um, do we have any Let's have a quick vote, actually. Who prefers Narnia to Middle-earth? Uh, votes for Narnia. Uh, <laughs> come on, Jill. You, you, <laughs> you have to be honest about this stuff. Any, any votes for Middle-earth? Yeah, OK. So I mean, I was, I was the same, right? And I felt like having, having... <laughs> Neither is also legit. Sorry, any, any for neither? OK. A, any for both? Can't, can't pick? Yeah, okay, also legit. So, I mean, I, I liked them both as a kid, right? And then I found that I got, I went more and more off Narnia when I realized how much of a Christian allegory it was. It feels like, again, it's that, it's the equivalent of taking Disco Elysium and saying, we want you all to vote for the leftist party. And that's kind of the message of our game. You know, it, it, it's too in your face. And, you know, obviously Tolkien and um, Lewis are big friends in reality. And they're both, um, 
uh, both Christians as well, but it felt like Lord of the Rings just offers you a lot more nuance and a lot more area for exploration rather than just telling you this is good, this is evil. Uh, and I've got three quotes from people which I think back up why Narnia is trash and Middle Earth is amazing. Um, you know, I, I might as well nail my close to the mast on this one. Uh, James Baldwin says the artist cannot and must not take anything for granted, but must drive to the heart of every answer and expose the question the answer hides. So we're never answering a question. If we want to do a game about a particular political or philosophical or other perspective, we're not ramming it in the player's face. We are letting them explore that issue and finding that they come away from it with even more questions and want to go away and do more things that they, they never thought they were, would be interested in. Um, Jeanette Winston says, art says don't accept things for their face value. You don't have to go along with any of this. You can think for yourself. Imagine if you make a game that makes people think that, right? Francis Bacon says the job of the artist is always to deepen the mystery. We don't want to answer the question. Um, we want to provoke thought and provoke our players or readers or viewers or whoever it might be to, to go away with more questions, right? Um, art shouldn't be comfortable, arguably. So we're going to back, go back to the creative process and expand on it a little bit. Um, particularly when it comes to uh, the stuff that we've just looked at today. I've added these bits in italics. Um, so part of the preparation phase might be immersing yourself in relevant media, right? If you're producing a cyberpunk game and all your experience with cyberpunk is um, playing other cyberpunk games, you know, go back to some of the 80s literature and read some of those cyberpunk novels and short stories and immerse yourself in that. Maybe watch some TV shows about it as well get out of the comfort zone a little bit. This is also not a bad time to at least be considering the themes. You know, what are the big questions that spring to mind that we could potentially start to answer or provoke players to start to answer or to ask more questions about um, with this particular product. Uh, in the incubation period, we can deliberately immerse ourselves in nature. Um, there's a concept called soft fascination that some of the creativity researchers have talked about, which is uh, where you, you just kind of sit about in a nice meadow and stare at flowers or bees. A, a lot of this sounds like hippie nonsense, right? But it does kind of work. Um, you know, just, just relax and stare at the flowers for long enough and allow that creative process to start working. Um, for illumination, where the idea is going to suddenly emerge, we could use those Breton-style found objects for some faster illumination. Um, there are probably uh, creative card games that might help for this kind of thing, throwing images at us, uh, maybe once upon a time, something like this. Uh, and in the verification stage, one of the reasons why at university level we teach so much media analysis, to my mind, isn't just so you can analyse existing media, it's so you can better understand your own, right? Um, if we say that the author is dead and that we as media analysts are in a better place to work out what a game means than the people who designed the game, um, that's also true of the games we designed ourselves. So if you can take a step back from it and use some of the techniques that you've learned to analyse what your game is really about, because it's almost never about the thing that you thought it was about at stage one, right? Um, that's when you can start to think, okay, well, if my game is actually, you know, another coming of age story, um, and I hadn't really expected it to be that. I thought it was going to be a good, a good versus evil one. But then, what was my coming of age like? What, what are the themes and metaphors that I need to add in to make this my personal story? Which bits of the game do I need to cut out because they don't fit in with the big theme that I want? How do I put appropriate metaphors from uh, Borges or otherwise uh, to really emphasize those themes? So this is a really useful uh, thing to add to stage five, I think. Um, so I promised to talk a little bit about world building. I think I've technically only got about 10 minutes left, um, unless I go over, which is, I believe, traditional for Oasis talks. Um, so this came, comes partly from a PhD research, which, which was into uh, ethical game design, and partly also from uh, an article I put into uh, game environments about um, ethical world building. Um, we see a lot of very boring fantasy and science fiction worlds that are basically Earth, the, the cultures in them are Earth cultures with the serial numbers filed off. You know, we get very, very bored of space Vikings um, or, you know, they're ninjas, but they've the book magic works in this setting, right? Not only is it potentially, or almost certainly, cultural appropriation um, with all of the problems that that causes, but it's also really, really creatively lazy and it makes our players or readers or whoever just switch off immediately. You know, they don't have to think anymore. Uh, so my perspective on this is we do it piecemeal. Now, it's worth bearing in mind here that if you're taking individual elements from a real-world Earth culture 
Um, that can still be cultural appropriation, right? So you're going to have to still be careful with this. Um, if you take the kind of classic D&D &D approach and you grab a monster or a, a legend from a, from a real world culture and then turn it into a spell or a monster in your setting and give it some hit points and durations and so on, that can still very much be appropriative. If you're talking about taking a cultural element that's a bit more about how this society works or how this religion works and is very much isolated from the rest and not immediately obvious because we're going to surround it with so many other layers of different cultures and fictional bits, that's probably more workable. Uh, you know, it just feels at this point like it's research rather than appropriation. I'm totally open to being critiqued on that and uh, um, I will happily ask, answer questions about that aspect of it. Um, but I think that if we do this in a more conscious and careful way, we can get something that's a bit more interesting. So I promised um, your weekly mention of the Roman Empire, um, <laughs> if you need it. Um, this is actually a Roman style republic, this worked example, so it's not the empire, but, but you know, you can be reminded of the existence of the empire by its absence from this worked example. Um, I came up with this in about 15 or 20 minutes, and there's potentially a lot more to go on with this. This is very much a starting point using those kind of techniques I've just elaborated on. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily particularly good either. It's just an illustration of here's how we could do a bit of fantasy world building that's not quite so boring. So we have senators as per Roman Republic. And as per Roman Republic, they're appointed by the consuls who are elected. Um, but unlike Rome, the only people who can vote are priests rather than soldiers. Uh, priests who've done at least 10 years' service and are therefore citizens, and therefore consuls and senators also tend to be well-respected priests. So, again, we immediately get a shift in the vibe of our fictional republic. It's, it's almost certainly going to go to war because, you know, it's a fantasy setting, conflicts happen, but it's run by priests, it's run by people who are presumably, depending on how you read priests in your fantasy setting, like they're either highly devoted, maybe very mystical, maybe obsessed with... Um, churchy sort of ritual sort of stuff. Maybe they're all corrupt, you know, we don't quite know. We haven't worked out that level of nuance as yet, but we know they're not going to be kind of gung-ho generals. Um, they're going to be people from a very different background. And we've got high-ranking soldiers who work for priests. Um, again, thinking about the warfare side, I've put as a very quick shorthand here, they have a samurai-style code of honour, which absolutely risks us doing their samurai, but in a fantasy world, right? Um, but for my mind, if we wanted to expand this, we would take a look at some of the original writings in, uh, you know, uh, Book of Five Rings or Book of Family Traditions on the Art of War or what have you, and we'd think about, okay, what elements do we want to borrow from that fit pretty well? How are those elements going to change when they go into our fictional setting based on everything else that's in here, maybe based on the religion that we're going to do a bit more working out? And how is this going to work out overall? Um, and it probably is going to end up quite different from that particular code of honour, it's probably going to draw from that and other ones. Um, they fight as mage cavalry, because I felt like we haven't had wizards uh, on horses much yet in fantasy. Um, so rather than having armour, they've got uh, spells and magical robes, and they wield a staff whose touch is death. And so we don't have very much armour in the setting at all, because if one of these people touches you, no amount of armour is going to help. So our skirmishers, who are not our mage cavalry types, have slings, small shields and swords, and that's got a bit of a kind of ancient Greece or ancient Rome kind of vibe to it as well, but it feels like a little bit distinct and a little bit like um, something that uh, fits with the setting with what we've got already. I feel like that's potentially massively expandable, whether it's any good or not, I don't know, I don't, I don't really care. I have no plans to expand it because nobody's paying me to do it, um, but it's, it's, it's a nice kind of indication of what can be done as a starting point. And obviously, if this takes 15 or 20 minutes, you could take a day or two and come up with 20 of these and then say, OK, we like this, we don't like this, throw this one out. This is the one we're going to go with. Oh, we're going to mash these two up together. You know, it's relatively easy. Um, so uh, to come up with your fictional religion, uh, there's a fantastic radio show originally, now available as a podcast, called Living with the Gods by BBC and British Museum. Um, and these are tiny 15-minute bite-sized episodes that go into a deep dive about one particular element from multiple different religions. So there's an episode that's just about fire, you know, sacred fires, what it means to have a fire burning in your temple all year round, um, what it means to have rituals around fire. Um, and you can listen to, I would say, to pick two or three that sound appealing to you and then come up with a fake religion that's based around those. You know, obviously you've got a bit of your culture already from, the, from step one. Here you can start to work out what your religion 
side is and it will feel real without being based on any one real world religion um, so that feels like a, again relatively easy one um, and here's where I borrow from sociology so sorry sociologists um, this may or may not be accurate sociology I don't really care at this point it is really really handy from a game design perspective though um, so apparently you can divide cultures into uh, various values that they have um, the first one is whether they're individualist, family, collectivist, or hierarchical. Individualist cultures are all about personal freedom, independence, who cares about families or groups. This is the generic one for video games now, right? Um, and it's a, although it feels like we're getting freedom because we can do what we want, it's a very American neoliberal kind of capitalist vision of freedom, really. You know, this, this idea that we don't have any responsibilities. Uh, we don't care about the community, we don't care about family. And again, whatever your politics, it's a bit boring because every game does it. And it's really unusual in the real world, right? Um, arguably, modern America is kind of like that. And arguably, a lot of that culture has spread. But if you're looking at a fantasy setting, then the idea of your murder hobo party with no ties whatsoever, that's much more of an American West vibe than any kind of real world medieval society or most fantasy societies in fiction right which all tend to have some kind of family collection or hierarchy so in a family the clan or the family is is crucial and your loyalty to your family is is important right and again that gives your player a whole load of needs and priorities that are not just about acquiring money and killing stuff um, in a collectivist society the whole community is important um, everyone works together including the leadership um, and then a hierarchical society has got very rigid social boundaries and structures with a clearly defined leadership. Um, this may not be that fun to play in, although in a more dystopian kind of setting, uh, you know, maybe you start the player out with some harsh disadvantages. Um, this could be fun or potentially, obviously, they might be the evil empire. I don't know. I could absolutely see uh, less unpleasant hierarchical societies in fiction, though. And again, part of the fun of having these stolen from sociology categories is that we can push them a little bit and we can say well in our fictional setting um, we're going to have a nuance where um, actually the closest thing we've got to um, good guys in the setting is a strictly hierarchical society and that's one of their big downsides uh, so we also have the values of direct emotional or polite um, a direct society expects its members to communicate honestly without exaggeration or understatement at all times, even to the point that other societies might consider them impolite or tactless. Um, I always think it's really useful to have a think about one's own society that one grew up in and, and try and figure it out, because it's often not the one we expect it to be. Uh, an emotional society tends to use exaggeration in communication. Uh, public display of emotions, even extreme emotions, is the norm. You know, if, you, if a close family member has died, you'll be expected to be on the street visibly weeping and wearing black, you know, for, for some weeks to show that you really care, right? Um, a polite society emphasizes politeness above all other values. Honesty is less important than tact. The main aim is to avoid causing offense. The culture is likely to have a, a dozen ways of saying no, none of which involve actually using or even implying the word no. Um, any thoughts as to which real world societies these might fit into or, or what our own society is? Uh, so I, I kept getting told as a kid, kind of growing up in the 70s, you know. Um, that some particular foreign society was super polite and would have no way of saying no, you know. And it was usually the Chinese, they have no way of saying no, they're so polite, you know. Um, so occasionally it would be our Arabs, they've got no way of saying no. Uh, or, or Indian people, or Persians, you know, what have you. And it all sounded like a little bit racist, like this notion that this, this society that's not us would have these kind of really specific ways of doing things. And, and, and you know, my parents or whoever w was telling me this would, would know about this. They were talking about British people. Uh, you know, <laughs> the, the UK has no way of saying no, especially in a kind of work context. Um, I feel like Finland is somewhat direct. Um, I, I, I've definitely encountered Finns who are willing to do a bit of tact for, for the foreigner so as to not, not offend me, right? Um, but, but there is also a tendency to be quite nice and direct, um, which I found quite refreshing. But you've probably all seen the Anglo-EU translation guide, like this has been going around on the internet for ages. And I, I kind of looked at and thought actually a lot of the British saying things are other ways of saying no but being super polite about it uh, and you know if you're in business this stuff is is dreadful like you 
you're all talking English because you're saying this is our common language, but then the British people are not actually using English accurately. They're using these kind of weird idioms and politenesses and tactful sayings to, to not say what they actually think, um, which is just going to cause confusion. So again, um, I mean, that's like obviously a bit of humour, but have a think about how your fictional society is going to be. Have a think about picking one of these that's an unexpected one um, compared to all of the other cultural values that you picked out uh, or that's different from your own one. Um, and then we get to uh, ways of greeting people. Are we going to be formal, casual or contextual? And members of a formal society, and some of these definitions might be out of date even in sociology, I don't really know. In a formal society, you'll always use strictly correct terminology. So an engineering lecture is always going to be Mrs. Doctor Professor Engineer, whether she's in the university or at a bar or at the gym. Um, now, allegedly, when this was written, Germany was like that. I've no idea if it's still quite that formal. Yeah, apparently pretty close. Uh, and yeah, again, it feels weird to me as a, as a Brit, especially a Brit who's mostly worked in art schools where everyone's kind of super informal and we're more like casual society. You know, she's always called Jane wherever she is, like even, even introducing herself to new students. Uh, and then in a contextual society, she might be Mrs. Doctor, Professor, Engineer in the university, Professor at the bar and Jane at the gym, right? All of which, you know, kind of makes a certain amount of sense to me. But again, think about this stuff. Maybe if you haven't been to it already, go to the fantastic Finnish Postal Museum and look at some of the elaborate greetings that people used to write when they wrote letters to each other uh, hundreds of years ago. Um, you know, these things are important. There are, there are going to be ways of greeting each other in your society and ways of addressing each other based on the titles. And they are going to be different from today. You know, again, it gets away from the murder hobo a little bit. And that gets your fantasy or science fiction setting a bit less generic, which is pretty nice. Um, so another crucial cultural value, are we meritocratic, nepotistic or corrupt? Uh, if we're in a meritocratic society, you get better, you get promotion, uh, you get, you know, into better jobs by your merit. Um, you can potentially get promoted all the way up to president or monarch, right? Um, in a nepotistic society, it's all about personal connections, especially through your family. Uh, in a corrupt society, it's all about paying either through actual cash or some other currency. Um, but you can get whatever you want in life if you're rich or powerful enough. Um, and bribery of one sort underpins all other relationships. Um, again, most societies like to think of ourselves as meritocratic these days, right? Um, I always suspect that most societies in the real world are, are some kind of mixture between the three, realistically. Uh, but, you know, how, picking a fictional society where one or the other of these is absolutely true, probably not meritocratic, right? Meritocratic societies in fiction are a bit boring compared to the highly corrupt or nepotistic ones, which give you obvious levers that you as a player can go and play around with. Uh, and I think this might be our last one, yeah. Um, so uh, last cultural value is are we indulgent or restrained? This is another picture of uh, Mance, UK. Um, it's a famous one that went, went viral a few years back after a, a New Year's party. Uh, are we an indulgent or a restrained society? An indulgent society uh, allows its members to indulge in whatever pleasures they want to as long as others aren't harmed. Public drunkenness is fine. Multiple relationships are accepted, etc. In a more restrained society, members have to keep their vices secret and they'll be punished if society finds out about the vices, either through the law or a fallen social status or both. Um, I kind of feel like, again, I don't know about Finland, but I feel like the UK has hit indulgent some years ago, uh, not just from this picture. Um, but, you know, Boris Johnson was fine to have multiple relationships and have parties and be, you know, doing whatever he wanted to. It, it was having parties that were illegal rather than being drunk at them or, or, you know, having multiple relationships and being caught out. None of that mattered. It was the breaking the law and doing stuff that he was telling other people not to do that finally caused his fall. Again, I've no idea really what Finland is like on this one. But thinking about this society and again, picking, picking stuff that doesn't immediately make sense. Like maybe we've got an indulgent society, but it's also hyper formal in the way that people greet each other. Um, and maybe it's... Um, also quite um, whatever the opposite of um, emotional in the way it uh, greets things. So may may maybe you're just allowed to do all this kind of indulgence sort of stuff as an outlet, despite the stultifying formality of the rest of life. Uh, and again, we get something that feels like it could be real, but doesn't feel like it's based on any one specific real society. So I've got one last slide, and uh, this is where it starts to get 
slightly more serious. Um, uh, I kind of feel like I, this one is in here because there's a real tendency in the games and the fiction that we make today and that we consume today to still be thinking about the big questions of the 20th century. And unfortunately, those big questions and crises of the 20th century are still with us. You know, it would be lovely to think we didn't have to think about them anymore. We do still have to think about them. Um, they are pretty much um, fascism and the fight against fascism, uh, genocide, genetic engineering, um, eugenics, um, industrialized warfare, uh, racism, imperialism, colonialism, capitalism, you know, all those things are still really important, right? Uh, much as we might want to banish a lot of them. Um, but we also have a really big one that we haven't really got much art about as yet. Um, so universities expect our graduates to have a variety of attributes, and we argue that employers have got similar expectations. Those attributes include according to Tissot University, resilience, problem solving, emotional intelligence, and cultural and global awareness. Um, Tampa University has something similar, talking about sustainability, well-being, and responsibility. We would hope that a degree prepares you not just for entering a specific career, you know, as game designer or uh, media scholar or whatever it might be, but also for the kind of rapidly changing world that we can expect over the course of your working lives. If you're an undergrad or um, uh, doing a master's at the moment, that's probably taking you into the, into the 2070s. Change is accelerating. Uh, my parents' generation, born in the 40s, were perhaps the last to expect to enter a job right after leaving school or university and then stay there for 50 years till they retired. Uh, I'm Gen X, um, and by contrast, we'd expect to change jobs every two or three years, often more in high turnover careers or geographical areas. Uh, millennials tend to expect shorter still, like six months to two years is quite common. Um, and if you're you know, late teens, early 20s at the moment, your future is still more uncertain. Do you inherit an ongoing worsening apocalypse where the climate crisis, the ecosystem crisis, political extremism and disease combine to bring economic, societal and agricultural breakdown within 10 to 20 years, which is what a lot of researchers are predicting? Or do we think that the political will will somehow be found to transform business as usual into a world where governments and corporations adhere to the Paris Agreement? Um, you know, I feel like I'm not going to give up hope because it would be really sad and dangerous to give up hope entirely but it doesn't look very likely at the moment unfortunately and we'd like to see change and games are potentially ways to drive that change right making art that people will engage with there is a third possibility if you're a techno optimist maybe elon musk or somebody is going to make a giant space mirror um, or we're going to have amazing carbon capture and storage devices that, that really work and are economically viable and we can roll them out in factories and not cause more pollution by creating them than, than they, they suck out of the atmosphere. I find this the least likely one, as you can probably already tell, but it's a possibility. And predicting the future is really, really difficult, right? Um, nobody in this room would have expected Trump to get elected or Brexit to happen 10 years ago. All of us, however politically aware we were, screwed up when it came to predicting the future. We don't know. Um, but we, as your educators, have got to prepare you for any of those three possibilities. That's part of our job. We also have to prepare you for any combinations thereof because society will change. You know, whatever of those three happen or whatever combination happens, we get a massive amount of change over the next half century and we have to help you navigate that and prepare you for it as best we can. And I feel like the best way we can do that is encouraging you to... Um, make those kind of games or make those kind of art objects about the crisis, get people thinking about them, get people talking about them in the same way that we talked about the big issues of the 20th century with most of 20th century art. And I think we're making progress on a lot of those 20th century issues, despite the um, two steps forward, one step back feeling that we might, we might often have. So that's pretty much it. Uh, just about on time, allowing for everyone going slightly over time. Um, I've got some slides, some further reading suggestions, which I'm not going to go into in detail, but any questions or thoughts or comments are all good. Thank you, Dr. Stark. I'm sure many people agree with you up to a point. <laughs> <laughs> all right, um, do we have any questions for Dr. Stark? There's one online. Oh, oh cool. Not a question, more a 
just wanted to point out there was one more Narnia online from <laughs> Thomas Wrightson. So just just that the Narnia doesn't get counted out. That, thank you. That's pretty crucial information. Um, I'll adjust my thinking accordingly in the future. All right. So, ah. So on, on one of the first slides that you had, you sort of mentioned briefly world building research, and that really caught my eye. And I would like to know more about what that entails beyond just the, the actual creative practice of it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so Mark J.P. Wolf has written at least a couple of edited collections on this that go into the theory behind it. And this kind of lecture was kind of mashed up between several different ones, including a, I can easily talk for an hour just on world building. There's a lot of good theory from him and also from Henry Jenkins that's worth looking at. Um, often referring back to Tolkien, actually, because Tolkien was one of the first people to have that really conscious world building process before we even knew what it meant. I mean, he talked about sub creation. Um, it is quite closely related to practice. Uh, the World Building Institute, I think, online has got a fair few videos about this as well. But yeah, there's Mark J.P. Wolf is your starting point for the theory, I think. I incidentally also wanted to make a question. Uh, I have worked with children and trying to work through, uh, well, I was teaching STEM at the moment. I was very much uh, into this uh, idea that creativity is a trained skill, that you should not tell children that you're not creative, therefore you shouldn't pursue that, that thing, right? But very much so, in, and it showed in, the, in this kind of like triumvirate of things that you should uh, relate when you talk about attitude that I feel like uh, is something that goes greatly under-discussed uh, a lot of the time. Obviously, uh, a lot of the people in the creative fields deal with things like imposter syndrome. And so, and, and, and very much so for me to ask you maybe what's your insight or like your uh, ideas on trying to uh, build a better, more positive creative attitude, how to uh, kind of be more positive towards your own ideas and so. Yeah, and that's a huge area in and of itself, isn't it? Um, it? It's a crucial one, you're right. Like, I absolutely still also get imposter syndrome, whether as a lecturer or as a game designer. You know, I've, got, I've won awards for um, game design, and I've um, been lecturing for years and haven't been sacked yet, you know, so I'm assuming I'm doing okay. Um, but you're right. Um, I think, I mean, Carol Dweck's work is worth a look, and I think I'd recommend her work to any educator anyway. She talked about um, fixed mindset versus growth mindset a lot and did a lot of research into kids rapidly deciding they've got a fixed mindset, often which will be, I'm not creative, I'm bad at art. And sometimes that's something that they've just come up with themselves. It's not a teacher who's been, who's told them the bad thing. It's just that they've tried something and not been good at it and immediately been put off. So there has been some more recent research work uh, based on hers that looks at ways you might encourage kids to have more of a growth mindset where they realize that if you do hard work in a given subject, you get better at it. And I think as adults, we can tell ourselves that and, and deliberately aim for it as well, because it is true, right? I mean, creativity is trainable. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Um, you can absolutely learn any of the skills I've seen. I mean, thinking back to Frank's advocacy of life drawing classes, I've seen students go from at 18 being barely able to draw stick figures, um, life drawing classes two, three, four times a week. And by the end of third year, you know, they're perfectly competent. They, they're not quite going to be you know, entry-level concept artists, but they're going to be fine to go into industry doing other 2D or 3D art without too much trouble. Oh, out of time. Uh, okay, so um, thank you very much, Dr. Stark. Um, we're going to end it there because Heike is called time. <laughs> and, and he's in charge right now. I'm just his puppet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ian. Thank you.